Thanks for listening to the Thyroid Fixer podcast with your host, me, Dr. Amy Horniman, aka The Thyroid Fixer, functional medicine practitioner, hormone and weight loss expert. We're talking all things thyroid, hormone, and health related in order to empower, educate, and transform you. So if you're ready to get your life back, let's get started. So this is going to be a game changer for you, and you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the Fixer line is Metabolism Fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And it might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there. You know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight. Add in metabolism fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, ooh, yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form, so you can drink it through your day. It's gonna flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some metabolism fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. Thyroid bioregulators, they honestly could be the next big answer in improving hypothyroidism. And I really believe that they are on the forefront of of treatments that could, and all bioregulators, I'll say, beyond thyroid, treatments that could change the way that we age and that could potentially change the way we treat in medicine. My guest today is Phil Mikens, and I have been trying to get Phil on. We've been clashing with schedules. There's been bioregulator shortages because, hey, they're popular. Let's just face it. Like I just said, they could be the answer. But Phil and I finally got together. This is going to be part one of two because I'm going to bring Phil back on. We need to keep going with this discussion, it could have been a three hour podcast, honestly. Well, let me tell you about Phil. So he has qualifications, including a master's degree, bachelor's degree from the UK and the US in food and vitamin technology, pharmacy and biochemistry. You'll hear him say he's a a recovering pharmacist because, you know, I mean, there's a place for medicine and then there's a place for bioregulators and peptides. He's been actively involved in anti-aging medicine since the late 80s and has contributed to numerous books, magazines, radio, TV shows, tons of podcasts on healthy aging. Currently, he's the editor-in-chief of Aging Matters magazine, the assistant editor to the Lifespan Medicine Journal, and director to the British Longevity Society. And this was the one founded by Marios Karazias. I don't even know if I say Mario's last name properly at all, but he is the Mac Daddy 
of bioregulators and peptides. Phil also advises the Stromboli Conference on Cancer and Aging and the London Anti-Aging Conference. In 1991, he was co-founder of the IAS Group, the International Anti-Aging Systems. This is an organization dedicated to the dissemination of preventative and regenerative medicine information and the supply of hard to obtain health products. So we're going to have the link to that in the show notes so you can go there and check out all the good stuff he has way beyond thyroid bioregulators. But the thyroid bioregulators that we talk about are on my store and they're going to change. They're going to change you. They're going to change the world. Phil, we've been talking about this for so long, and I know my listeners have been waiting to hear about bioregulators because I'm always talking about peptides and the benefits of peptides, but now we're into not a totally different realm than peptides, but but you know, bioregulators are kind of like the next big thing, and they might even overtake peptides in what they can do and their effects on the body. So thank you for jumping on here and bringing us your knowledge on this. Oh, my, my, my pleasure. I can't wait. I can't wait. So let's just start off with the big, broad question. Okay. What are bioregulators? Basically, it's a term that's been developed by Professor Vladimir Kavinson and his team, a very long and established institute that resides in St. Petersburg. And um, basically, in, they're two things. Well, first of all, what is a peptide? Well, a peptide is made up of amino acids. So the moment you get two amino acids that are conjoined, you have a peptide. That's called a dipeptide. And, and, you know, some people say in the medieval swamp, that was the moment when they conjoined that you had information, you had instructions. So bioregulators, uh, peptide, are short chains of amino acids. So what we're talking about are two, three or four amino acids. They are particularly short because, of course, there are lots of peptides out there, BCP157, just to name one, that are much longer and you might get into, I know, semorelin, for example, you know, and of course we change the names as the amino acid chains get longer. We might call them proteins. We could even end up calling them hormones. So human growth hormone being 191 amino acids. And of course, when the chains get very long, they get problematic in the delivery. In other words, they, you couldn't swallow them and expect them to go through the stomach. You would, you would have to inject them or maybe use them as a nasal spray or some, some other means. But these very short chains, two, three, four, they do pass through the stomach. So they are bioavailable even if swallowed. And the there's all the studies out there because what we're talking about used to be a Soviet military secret and they were playing with these 30 and 40 years ago. So they have masses of information, a lot of which is now in English. And the other thing that makes them very unique, and this is the hardest part to understand, to be honest, and I think even Professor Cavins and his team haven't really elucidated as to why they have this effect. What's the special thing about bioregulator? Because there is a gazillion two, three and four chains of amino acids out there, peptides, but they're not all categorized as bioregulators. So in this meaning, if we take, for example, the thyroid, a lot of the adult population, as you know, Amy, is, is hypothyroid. They don't produce enough thyroid hormones. So if you take the thyroid peptide by a regulator, it would activate genes that would endogenously make your own thyroid gland make more thyroid. But weirdly, if you were hyperthyroid, in other words, you had too much circulating thyroid, the same peptide silences the same genes to bring you down. So it, it, it bioregulates. Somebody said to me recently, it sounds like an adaptogen. And right. I had say ah actually yes and i would even go as far to put a theory out there that it could be that these adaptogen plants contain some of these peptides because what we're talking about here is throughout nature in plants in animals in us right and i'm glad you mentioned that about the the adaptogens because i thought the same thing when mm -hmm. i heard you on ben greenfield's podcast describe specifically, and I was super happy that you brought up the thyroid bioregulator, that it can literally bring someone from a hyper state down to normal and bring someone from a hypo state up to normal. And that yeah. is fascinating. And it, it doesn't matter how many adaptogens are out there yeah. on the market, supplementally, yeah. nothing, nothing 
hits mm. the thyroid like that. I mean, that is just flat out amazing. and could actually change the way that we do treatment for hyper or hypothyroidism, any kind of thyroid disease. Yeah. yeah. I'll say one caveat. Okay. You mm-hmm. have to have the gland, right? Okay. If, if, you, if you've lost your thyroid, if you've had it removed, the peptide isn't going to operate for you. It needs the gland there. I know that's there are handfuls of people, and thankfully it's not many people, but it is. It does happen, and mm-hmm. there are other peptide bioregulators like the testes, the prostate, the ovary. Again, you have to have the gland. Yeah, if the right. ladies take the prostate, won't work. If if the gentleman takes the ovary, won't work. Right. So, but but that's just a handful, a handful of them. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It is very very unique, and it also I think helps to explain. I spoke to Professor Cavanson not that long ago, a few months ago. And I asked him in the 40 years it had been on the Russian markets. And when I say Russia, I mean Russian speaking countries. It is in the Ukraine. It is in Kazakhstan and, you know, places like that. Mm -hmm. And he thinks it's been they've been dosed over 100 million times. Okay, so originally it was designed for their elite troops. It was designed for their cosmonauts and it was designed for their Olympic teams. Mm -hmm. Obviously, since Russia's changed. In the 90s, the market has become commercialized. They're on those markets as food supplements, not the injections, but right. the actuals are on the market as food supplements. And But the injections are used in clinics as well. That's something you want to get into that. We'll get into that. So, and as a result, they're on wide use. And the amazing thing is in all that time and in all those uses, they have never documented a serious side effect. And it could be because of this bioregulation. So coming back to the thyroid again, you could imagine that if you're going to be taking a thyroid uh, medicine every day, mm-hmm. whether that's T3, T4, or maybe maybe armor, mm-hmm. the desiccated natural thyroids, you would have to monitor yourself because you are literally putting the hormone in, right? right. So sensible people would want to make sure they're not you know, going to superological levels and possibly downregulating their own thyroid gland from any production. I mean, that does happen in different glands. But the peptide works in a very different way. You're not putting the hormone in you. You're putting in a peptide which acts as a gene switch, which enables your own thyroid to produce more and in balance, you could argue as well, right? T3, T4, T1, T2, the forgotten thyroid hormones, as I like to sometimes refer to them. Um, yeah, thank you. So that's you what know, I call them too, Phil. I love that you just said that because I, I call T2 the forgotten thyroid hormone because it does so much, but we can get to that. Right. Yeah, no, cool. And uh, and I think that's also why prior to the peptide, uh, my favorite, because I used to be a pharmacologist. And so my favorite, as I like to say, I'm a recovering pharmacologist, but but my uh, favorite was was the natural thyroids like armor. Mm-hmm. And, and it was only fairly recent. I, I thought the reason that most patients seem to do much better on those than something that was pure T3 or T4, especially T4, of course, and we go there, but um, was because it contained all four of the pig porcine glands. But I found out only a few years ago that the pig thyroid, I'm sure you know this, is bioidentical to the human, Mm -hmm. exactly the same, which is unusual. That doesn't happen with animal hormones very often for obvious reasons. So I think that's another feather in its cap for Mm -hmm. desiccated uh, thyroids. But in this case, what we're talking about, of course, is a a very different matter. But those, there are two choices in the peptide world. The first choice is, of course, you have a synthetically produced molecule. okay. And then the second choice, of course, is you have a naturally derived molecule. So it is actually possible to get these natural peptides from cows and pigs. okay. Mm -hmm. so bovine and, and porcine, but they're filtrated. To such a point that you're getting just the peptide and i always say folks because they always raise it of course will i get mad cow disease from it no well firstly in 100 million doses it's never been seen but it's impossible because to get a prion you have to have a dalton sized molecule which is fairly large in the world of chemistry and the peptides are nano sized they're tiny by comparison so there's no the animals are healthy anyway but Beyond that, the filtration system means that no prion could pass into the product. So I think it accounts for their very good safety profile. 
Very nice. And one thing I, I have to circle back on, so I don't forget when you were mm-hmm. mentioning about not having a thyroid. So I do have listeners that have had a total thyroidectomy, a uh, radioactive iodine treatment on their thyroid. What about those who have Hashimoto's and over the years, their thyroid gland has slowly been destroyed and is kind of teeny tiny right now because it's just been eaten away by their own body for lack of a better description. Would the bioregulator still be something? And we're not saying go off your medication, but would the bioregulator still be something that they could bring in to potentially get a little bit more optimized in addition to their thyroid hormone replacement? The short answer is in the majority of cases, yes. There are potential issues with people who suffer from very potent autoimmune issues in that they shouldn't go on to the peptides too quickly. They should slow down their approach. And of course, those who are on medications already supporting their thyroid glands, we have to say monitor yourself extra carefully because you may, if you, you know, if you're putting in, I don't know, whichever hormone you're using, Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to add the peptide, you're going to encourage your own thyroid to produce some more, maybe, not as much as you'd like if you have a a greatly atrophied thyroid because of Hashimoto's, but there should be some impact. And because of that, you may need to reduce the medication that you're on. It's something to be aware of. Hopefully you might come off it, but at least, you know, monitor yourself extra carefully during that time. Definitely. I think that's important to note too, as well, because people will, they'll pile it on. I mean, they'll, they'll take the bioregulators and they'll keep taking their meds and they might go hyper. Sure. You know, I'm sure, you know, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. I'm I'm sure, you know, and I'm sure through your great podcast, you have maybe told this story, but forgive me if I tell it again, you know, I quite like looking back at the old fashioned ways of doing things. Yes. Blood tests are wonderful. And you know, it's great. Keep doing them. But there were the old, before there were blood tests, what did they do? And of course, thyroid is a is an amazing thing because, as you know, it's very much involved in our temperature regulation. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm going to speak Celsius. You'll have to get the calculator yep. out. Go uh, ahead. Yep. <laughs> but these are the numbers in Celsius. So when you get up in the morning, you know, get a thermometer first thing you do, and of course, it's so easy now. Put it on the forehead, stick it in the ear, and note your temperature. And look at and do that every day for about two weeks, and see what your typical number is and you'll be amazed how close those numbers will be but you should be for a healthy thyroid you should be between 36.3 and 36.7 degrees celsius okay now if you're regularly under 36.3 and i you know some folks drop into 35s um you are hypothyroid you have a weak thyroid and of course should you be over regularly over 36.7 your hypothyroid but it's so unbelievably accurate and as you whatever you do in your uh, regimen whether it's uh, you know taking iodine eating seaweed um, taking armor or using the peptide bioregulator whatever it is if you keep monitoring your temperature you will see the change the incremental 0.1 celsius change it's quite remarkable quite remarkable No, it is. And that is the old school way of doing it. And actually, one could argue possibly more accurate because we know when, especially over here, well, I have patients all across the world. So I see it everywhere. Doctors will only test that thyroid stimulating hormone marker, that TSH. And we know that that can be wildly inaccurate. So now we have someone walking around with low body temperature, they're gaining weight, they're losing hair, they're constipated. And they're not getting diagnosed. So I'm glad you brought that up as well. So this will, the Mm. bioregulator will work across the board. The only caveat is you have to have the gland. But even if they, you mentioned something earlier, Phil, I want to circle back to it for those who don't have the thyroid gland. All is not, all hope is not lost because there are bioregulators for adrenals for now. I I was talking with Nat Nidham, love her. I know she, she adores you. And she was saying for the thyroid, and maybe you can expand on this, that there would definitely be other bioregulators we would want to add in, not just thyroid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if we're talking about people without thyroid glands, it would be quite a different program. But if we talk about people with 
thyroids who mm-hmm. want what we call a synergistic program. In other words, to take other agents that will boost the whole program. Yeah. Well, I did an interview with Professor Cavinson some time ago now, and we did a number of different issues, problems, disorders. And there was one uh, peptide bioglet that was synergistic with all of them. There were other groups, other things, don't get me wrong, but there was one that was synergistic with all of them. And and when we think about it, it's not really a surprise because that is the blood vessel. And the blood vessel peptide basically is helping the delivery of blood to the cell throughout the body. And if you think about that, if you're delivering whatever tissue it is with more blood, it's going to be delivering more nutrition and it's going to be removing more toxins. Uh So anybody who wants a boost to their thyroid program, though, I would say, yes, go in and also take the blood vessel and you can take them at the same time. I'll be happy to get into dosing and and cycling and all the rest of it uh, whenever you want to. So that is a definite one. And you hit the nail on the head just a moment ago, the adrenal. And there are a handful of the peptides that what I've seen in many people fast results you know and big results and the adrenal is one of them without doubt but when you think about it again perhaps it's not a big surprise when you stop and think about how many hormones do the adrenals produce right a lot mm-hmm. yeah a lot and yep. i think a lot of people out there are familiar with the phrase adrenal fatigue yes. which you know say come two three four o'clock in the afternoon they're exhausted they want a nap you know and it never was like that before and they haven't changed their program it's adrenal fatigue it's a burnout and of course or should also mention a lot of the ladies who are entering their menopause it's one of the problems they have that as their estrogen levels decline the body kind of burns the adrenals a lot harder so again adrenal support for the ladies of that age is a good thing i think Definitely. Definitely. And then what would you say about other autoimmune conditions? So let's say a person has Hashimoto's, which we know in the thyroid world, 95% of all hypothyroidism is autoimmune related anyway. So what else should we be doing for that autoimmune component? Mm, That's a good, that's a good question. There is another peptide that I personally love, and I think it's got quite a long story behind it. And that's the pineal peptide bioregulator Mm -hmm. now this spins us off into the story of the pineal gland which i think is a tremendous story i'll do it i'll do the 10 second tour yeah i think we most folks know it's a p-shaped size thing it's in the middle of our brains if you if you draw a line across the top of your ears in the middle of your forehead that where they dissect would be where the pineal is give or take the hindus of course paint the bindu the third eye which is a representation of the pineal gland. There's lots of esoteric things involved with the pineal gland, which I won't mention unless you want me to. But fundamentally, there's one thing, there's not just one thing, of course, like with all hormones, but there is one thing that the pineal gland is very responsible for, and that's the production of melatonin. And melatonin is in our blood when it's dark, i.e. when we sleep. And it is an instruction to the rest of the endocrine system to know when it's night and when it's day. And and that gets us into our circadian rhythms. And we all know how bad we feel if we miss one or two nights sleep or whatever, or if we're doing shift work or we're doing a lot of jet lag, plane travels. And of course, if you have a nice healthy circadian rhythm, you have hormonal cyclicity. And if you have hormonal cyclicity, you have a good immune system. So now we begin to see how fundamental the pineal gland is. A marvelous man, I know him well, uh, Dr. Walter Pierre Pauly, who's a world melatonin expert, wrote all the early books about pineal and, and melatonin and stuff. He once said to me, and I've never forgotten it, he said, think of the pineal gland as the conductor of the endocrine orchestra. And if if you have an orchestra, I, in this case, all the other hormone glands, and you'd have no conductor, what do you have? Well, you make you make noise. But if you have a conductor in the orchestra, you make music. So coming back to the peptide, it will help us endogenously. That is to say, inside our own bodies, not exogenously. I mean, you can take melatonin as a tablet. Of course you can. Mm -hmm. Uh, But by taking the peptide, you're invigorating, you're, you're activating the genes and you're helping your own pineal gland to make more melatonin. There's another aspect to the pineal gland, which... I think is 
very strong for in its favor. And that is, it appears to be the number one peptide for lengthening telomeres. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is a big thing at the moment, that telomeres being the end caps on our chromosomes, once described as the aglets on our shoelaces, which are those bits of plastic on the end. And you can imagine if you had no bit of plastic on the end of your shoelace, it would be a mess, right? It'd be all frayed and a mess. And in some ways, they think that telomeres are doing that for the chromosomes. They're stopping them from unraveling. And there's a lot of evidence that the longer the telomeres are, the, the more healthy the cell is. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. and if you want to we can talk about the work of uh, an american doctor called bill lawrence who has been using these quote unquote russian discoveries and russian protocols in 130 uh, american patients most of whom by the way are actually medical doctors so <laughs> okay very nice maybe they'll t- he'll turn those mds into believers that peptides could be or bioregulators could be the next wave and kick out big pharma. We won't I, need I, all of those band-aid medications. I think so. And the other exciting thing is that these folks, if as it were, go home and they can incorporate this knowledge, their own personal experience into their own practices. Because number one, I've been messing about with anti-aging medicine now for more than 30 years. And the number one problem we have is I have someone come to me and say oh that was great I was really excited I really want to do that is there a doctor in my area that can help me and then I, I say well, where do you live and they go Paris New York you know I don't know Amsterdam uh, you know out of Mongolia the problem is you know how do we get people within a reasonable distance that can help folks you know right. that, that's one of the classic problems we have mm-hmm. absolutely Okay, so you mentioned anti-aging, Phil, so I have to go down that rabbit hole and steer just a little tiny bit off the thyroid bioregulators. I always say that I don't care if I live to be 95 or 100. Mm -hmm. I'll live till 80, but I want to look like this. I want to look young. So what bioregulators would you recommend for us that want to truly anti-age, not just live longer? Mm-hmm. No, that's, well, that's the sixty-four billion dollar question, isn't it? Oh, it's probably right. sixty-four trillion dollar question in this days, uh, in the, with the inflation we have at the moment. But no, I think yeah, it's a good question. I think if you want to keep it to peptide bioregulators, I think the pineal's there. Mm-hmm. I think the pineal's there. Keeping all cells younger, healthier by elongated telomeres, fundamentally. And I should make reference here to a very, very large human trial that was conducted in the Soviet Union. They've done a few, they've done three or four, but the biggest one was 11,000 workers, factory oil and gas workers living in Siberia, right? Which is tough, right? It's not yeah. living in New York, is it, right? right. So, um, <laughs> and um, they, uh, 8,000 of them were given peptides and 3,000 of them were given vitamins as, you know, so in other words, a placebo. And they monitored these folks, believe it or not, over 12 years. Now, they, aren't, they, aren't, they, they monitored a lot over six, and then there was another extended period, and then I think a, a smaller number, but it was still a 1,000 people, even at the very end. But what they showed was, and don't forget, when people started, they were aged between sort of 40 and 60. So you'd had some of these people 12 years later, they'd well and truly retired, you know, right. and they were still following them. So what they showed was the folks on the peptides had one third of the morbidity. So in other words, they had two thirds less likely problems and they had one third of the mortality. So if you think about that, being useful and being older kind of goes hand in hand in glove. So I think there were three principal peptides that shone in, in that study. And that was the pineal, the blood vessel and the thymus, because obviously thymus is greatly involved with, um, with immunity. Mm-hmm. so they, those three those three stood out beyond that it's interesting to look at what the olympic teams used because of course these people were incredibly fit mm-hmm. you know incredibly agile and they were they were using things like the muscle peptide the men were using testes i think some of the ladies were using ovary and also fundamentally liver and kidney mm-hmm. and in some cases pancreas but it it does come down to you know, the trouble with anti-aging medicine is where do you start and where do you end, right? 
Right. And everything in life is cost and convenience, right? Right. If it's super costly, you're not going to do it. If it's incredibly inconvenient, you're not going to do it or unlikely to, right? So where do you start? Where do you end? I always say to folks, what's your weak point? If you know what your weak point is, you've got a bad thyroid gland, get it fixed, right? Yep. If you don't know what your weak point is and, you, and you're perhaps not doing any testing, like you, you should perhaps go and find out what your telomere length is, what your DNA methylation is, et cetera, mm -hmm. and other things, look at your family history. What, what did mum and dad have? What did grandpa and grandma have? And stuff like that. And that may give you a clue to say, oh, yeah, there's a lot of diabetes in our family. Oh, there's a lot of heart disease in our family. And again, address the weak point, I would, right. I would suggest. Offbeat, of course, there are different peptides, although I wouldn't say they were peptide bioregulators. For example, some of my own favorites are the GHRPs. That's the growth hormone releasing peptides. A couple of quick names for you, GHRP2, GHRP6, Semirelli, they will encourage more growth hormone. Yep. This is more prudent to people who are older, right? I'm not talking about people who are 20 years old. Right. It's not going to do that yeah, much. they're if, producing enough. They don't if need they it. They do it all right, yeah. right? But if you're way past 35, then it's going to have a big effect. Although there's a bit of a cutoff point. It is harder once you're in your 50s. I will accept that. But if you're sort of between 35 and 55, it will have the biggest impact. And you, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to have better skin, better hair, more muscle, less fat. It's a very powerful tool that we have in the box. No question about that. What do you think about, see, I'm, I'm going down this rabbit hole now. What do you think about CJC and ipamorelin as compared to the GHRP to GHRP6 and the semorelin? I don't have a lot of experience with that. The only uh, guy who I um, greatly uh, value is a, an American doctor called Rich Walker. And Rich has done a lot of studies with different um, peptides, especially JHRPs. And the interesting thing, the most interesting thing in my book with GHRP2, GHRP6, and I can't speak for the others entirely, and I, I hope well, they might be, but I don't know. And that is that so, for example, if this is a graph and on the bottom we've got time and, and on this on the vertical axis, we've got the amount of growth hormone or IGF-1 in blood. OK, in a normal course of a day, 24 hours on this clock, we'd see a bit of a spike in the morning because that's the get up and go impetus. Right. That's the here's daylight. Let's get going. And then we would see several smaller um, pulsite releases of growth hormone during the day. OK, mm -hmm. this is why we don't like pellets, because if you yeah. stick a pellet in your bum, then oh, I'm sorry, using a British colloquialism, <laughs> um, <laughs> you're going to have a graph like that. Well, what damage does that do? It's not bioidentical. Right. So and of course, if you take if you get up in the morning and decide to inject yourself with growth hormone, may even pop, possibly a low dose, you're going to see what's so-called bolus injection. You're going to see quite a peak and then really not much going on. Again, is it bioidentical? Does that make it safe if you do that for many years? OK, now, when you take, according to the work of Rich Walker, when you take GHRP2, GHRP6, and there's something a bit special about Semirelli, which we can get into, what you see is exaggerated peaks greater than they were before, but natural. Mm -hmm. identical so i think you know because it comes down to like and this i'm not i'm stealing this from the great jonathan wright dr jonathan wright he always says you know if we get medicine wrong we have to ask ourselves three questions are we using the right molecule is it a bioidentical have we got the dose right and the third one which is the toughest one have we got the timing right okay mm -hmm. so okay. so i think there's you know I know that makes it complicated and I know everyone wants an easy way out, but you know, it's what separates us from orthodox medicine because what we're doing is highly individualized. Definitely. I, I appreciate that. I really want to pick your brain on that. I, now I promise I'll bring it back to the thyroid, but I wanted to pick your brain on that for sure. Just to get the anti-aging piece in there. Cause my listeners know that I'm huge into anti-aging. So back to the, you had mentioned cost and convenience. Here's the thing 
about bioregulators. They really are convenient to take. So go ahead and go into the dosing. I find this fascinating because with supplements, as you know, mm. you got to pretty much take them every day. I mean, yeah, you can do some cycling in and out here and there, but in order to get that therapeutic effect, if I want to raise your vitamin D level, I'm not going to be able to raise your vitamin D level by you taking vitamin D 10 days out of the month. It's not going to happen. So tell us about the dosing of okay. bioregulators. Of course, there are possibly different doses when people have medical issues, but we're not, we'll leave, we'll park those to one side mm -hmm. and we'll talk about folks who are healthy, but aging and they want to be a bit better, look a bit better, perform a bit better or slow aging or whatever, whatever angle we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. The typical way of starting on a peptide bioregulator is to take two capsules a day for 30 days. OK, mm -hmm. they call that the intensive course. All right. Now, and then that's it. You're not going to, in theory anyway, you are not ever going to take it every day again, because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get the messages, which just let me reiterate, are in food, you know, are in are in plants, are in animals. We, we wrote, sorry, I'm going to flash a book at you. We wrote this scientific book, which is Peptides in the Epigenetic Control of Aging. Mm hmm. We think this th these are the missing messages from food, okay, gene switches, individualized gene switches. So, so once you've done that first month, the typical regime, the 80-20 rule, in other words, 80% of people will carry on like this, is to take two capsules a day for 10 days in the month. So you are not every day, okay? Now, it's feasible that if you are a nice, healthy person and you just want to Put the edge on things and you, you're really getting into preventative medicine you can reduce that to 10 days every three months so now you'd be and and the, they come in packs of 20 capsules right which is a 10-day course right yep and now you're looking at four packs a year yeah, right that's crazy that's so i think that's so doable right and i'll throw a number out there and i know it's not always good to quote money because times change and all the rest of it and there are some differences between the peptides, but you're looking at about $40 for a box. Right. Of peptides, okay. So suddenly you might say to yourself, oh, $160 a year compared to some other specialized supplements that are out there seems like a bargain. <laughs> it kind of does. And even compared to copays for mm -hmm. medication, it seems like a bargain. So how yeah. long, now I know everybody's going to be different. I know everyone's going to, but how long, approximately would it take mm -hmm. for someone let's say they even did the medical dosing the the more severe case dosing and taking it once a day for 30 days maybe even once a day for 60 days and then you start spacing it out how long mm -hmm. before they start to see a change typically depends on the patient of course depends on the uh, peptide in question but typically one to three months okay is is an impact will have some kind of impact if people have medical problems we tend to say stay on two capsules a day and at least until such time as you've seen improvement mm -hmm. but you no know, but no i think in the majority of cases one to three months i've certainly known people who've done say before and after testosterone checks for example in men and you know within two months they've said i've definitely seen an increase or you know those sorts of things so it might be a bit long. I mean, the trouble with the telomere testing is um, most of the folks I know don't go and have their telomeres tested every month. Uh, they might do right. it once a year or something like that. Again, cost and convenience. Right. But no, one to three months, I would say, is typical. And that's, you know, that's what we say for hormones. Even when we start using bioidentical hormone replacement, we say, you know, you got to give it three months. Yeah. When we start optimizing thyroid with medication, we, you got to give it three months. So yeah. that is completely doable and logical to give it a really nice chunk of time yeah. before you start to see results either in yourself or even results in your, as you said, your body temp or your labs. So that that's, that's completely doable. Amy, I'd like to mention something here, if I may, that I hope mm -hmm. will be able to stress. And, and that is coming back to the, the Soviet research, the Russian research. What they said was, is that every cell, every cell in our body has a biological reserve of about 30%. And, and the peptides seem to release or activate this biological reserve. And it seems to be, 
across the board, i.e. in animals, in plants, and in humans. Mm -hmm. And Kavanson has gone as far as to suggest that if the maximum lifespan currently is 120 years, right, give or take, and that most people are living on average to about 80, even that difference is about 30%. Mm -hmm. So is it is it feasible that somehow these super centenarians are activating their biological reserves? OK, and yeah. I very quickly will mention this. And what I'm about to mention is only months old and it comes from Tel Aviv, University of Tel Aviv. They've yeah. been doing experiments with some of these peptide bioregulators with strawberries. And they find that the strawberries that are using certain peptides and forgive me, I don't know which ones off the top of my head are producing 30 percent more fruit. You'll find that this number comes up again and again and again. It's quite extraordinary. That makes complete sense because I've I have always thought this. I've never said it on a podcast, but you know, when you think about aging and just like you said, Phil, we really are meant to live to 120. Now, none of us can conceive that because you only see one or two people featured in the news for their hundredth birthday, right? Mm. You don't see 100, 110. You, we don't see 120 ever in our lifetime, but that's what our, the human body was made. Yeah. It just makes sense that there's something being held back, be it our environment, chemical toxicity, the foods that we eat, lack of nutrients, whatever yeah. it is. So if this could be the key that turns on the ability to live longer, and like I said, you, you got to look good and feel good as you're living longer, right? Absolutely. I mean, so that brings me to one of my last questions for you. What about big pharma? So we already saw big pharma coming in. And what is terzepatide? What is semaglutide? Now that they are the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss now, but it costs you two grand a month to do it because big pharma came in and said, look at that peptide. It works. Bam. Now you need a prescription for it. Yeah. What are we looking at for bioregulators? Could that well, happen? The, well, it, I, who knows? You know, they have got so much money, power and influence across the board, as we've seen in recent events. And I won't get you delisted by mentioning them. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and the craziness of all that, you know, so it could happen. But there is one prevailing advantage to these bioregulators. They are in food. OK, yeah. and and it, it, although they could try and stamp out the supplements as food supplements or whatever, because the bottom line with most of the world's authorities is they accept that food supplements exist, but they do not want them to do anything. And they certainly don't want you to mention a medical problem when you mention the food supplement. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the challenges. The whole nutritional world knows that it's a challenge. How the hell do you tell people that vitamin C is? got certain advantages for them you know that's the challenge that everybody in the industry is aware of so it is going to be very very difficult to put an outright ban on as i say substances some of the peptides that are out there on the market right now would have a hard job very hard job to justify themselves under the dietary health and supplement act right yeah but these peptides can justify themselves under the in my opinion mm -hmm. i'm not a lawyer but in my opinion could have a justification so i think it will be harder for them just very quickly I, i'm sorry to take too much of your time up but mm -hmm. i just wanted to mention a study that came out of amsterdam in 2016 they had a bunch of ladies 10 or 12 that were all centenarians every one of those ladies was over 100 one lady was what they call a super centenarian which means she was over 110 that's mm -hmm. i think right now in the world you know there aren't 20 people on the planet that are verifiably over 110 it's very rare to get to 110 anyway they had one lady that was they every week they they went to them and they took a small sample of their blood and they monitored their blood for stem cell activity and telomere length what they found was in every single lady and the eldest lady lived to be 113 they found that in the last two weeks of their life, two to three weeks of their lives, the stem cell activity plummeted, the telomere length dr dramatically shortened. So now the big question now then would be, is that cause or is that consequence? OK, because nobody ever talks about death. Well, not never, but rarely talk about death markers. They talk about biological age markers, 
but there are also death markers. Okay? Right. Right. So I know it's the other side of the coin, but um, yeah. but I hope somebody finds that interesting. <laughs> that's very interesting. No, that's very interesting because I I think the possibilities are endless mm. with what Mother Nature is giving us because yeah. it's not going to come in the form of a big pharma drug. So. No, and and of course, if you think about most drugs that go into the body they kind of crash and bash about hoping to meet a receptor that they can utilize and what other damage when you've got a peptide found in food that has existed ever since you know life has existed right um, that's nano sized and acts directly on genes doesn't go to receptors goes directly to genes in fact the russians have got all these incredible slides which you end up putting 3D glasses on to see the interaction between the peptide and the gene and the gene reacting. So, you know, it's fundamental. Most drugs are treating symptoms and they're not treating the root cause. Right. Most. Absolutely. Well, Phil, I, I, I apologize for having to cut this short. I know we both have schedules here, but I want to bring you back on because I feel like we could talk for another hour and just go down a couple of different rabbit holes we didn't even get a chance to touch on today. So for those listening that are interested in the thyroid bioregulator, the thyreogen, we have that on my store. And then we're going to have a link in the show notes as well to all of the other bioregulators that you can get from IAS, which is Phil's, this is like your, your baby, right, Phil? This is like your, yeah, yeah. I've been doing it a long time. And it, it stands for international anti-aging systems. And we mm-hmm. nailed our flag to that post along uh, three decades ago. Yeah. So uh, we like to think of ourselves as one of the pioneers in the field. You really are. You really are. And, and I mean, there's a ton on there beyond bioregulator so that's why i'd like to bring you back on and really go down the peptide rabbit hole some of the things that you have on there for thyroid are just fascinating so we'll plan that out we'll have you maybe just do a part one and part two and if anyone prefers a magazine type format we have a magazine called aging matters and uh folks can either buy them or they can download them free of charge so uh, look us up well there you go absolutely well thank you phil we'll have all of your info in the show notes thank you